So a word on terminology to begin with. I'm guided throughout this talk, of course, by the writings of Smith, but Smith did not use the word empathy. That was coined in English only in the early 20th century, in 1909 to be precise. Uh, Smith and Hume spoke instead of sympathy, but they used that word in roughly the same way we use uh, empathy today. And so I will use the terms as more or less um, uh, equivalent to one another. Um, sympathy when I'm quoting Hume and Smith inside the text, as it were, and then sometimes switch to empathy when I'm talking more broadly about what I take to be the implications of their views, of Smith's in particular. With that in mind, let's turn to a debate between Hume and Smith, it's been already mentioned today several times, over the nature of sympathy. Hume construed sympathy as passed from one person to another, mostly by way of contagion. You look sad, so I feel sad. You are cheerful, and that cheers me up. Exactly how this contagion works for Hume is not entirely clear. Sometimes he indicates that I infer your feelings from your expressions. Sometimes it seems that there is no intermediary inference, and your feeling or your expression of your feeling has a direct impact on me. In either case, I wind up with the bare idea of your feeling for Hume. I then associate this idea in my imagination with the idea of myself. I imagine myself feeling what you feel and thereby come to experience your feeling. For Smith, by contrast, we feel what others feel by projecting ourselves into their situations and imagining how we would feel there. Smith allows that sometimes it, quote, may seem, unquote, that sympathy arises merely by contagion. It's often read that, uh, as if Smith is conceding something to Hume there, but I don't think he is. Strong expressions of joy and grief especially can light up or dampen the feelings of others. But even here, he says, the joy and grief transfer over, quote, because they suggest to us the general idea of some good or bad fortune that has befallen the person in whom we observe them, unquote. We imagine ourselves in the situation of having experienced good or bad fortune. Moreover, even as regards grief and joy, and certainly as regards most other feelings, we do not sympathize with any depth or nuance unless we know more about the person's situation. And now we come to the first quotation on your handout. General lamentations which express nothing but the anguish of the sufferer create rather a curiosity to inquire into his situation than any actual sympathy that is very sensible. The first question which we ask is, what has befallen you? Till this be answered, though we are uneasy both from the vague idea of his misfortune and still more from torturing ourselves with conjectures about what it may be, yet our fellow feeling is not very considerable. Smith concludes, quote, sympathy does not arise so much from the view of the passion as from that of the situation which excites it, unquote. This difference between Hume and Smith has the consequence that for Smith, but not for Hume, it may often be the case that I feel something different from what you feel when I sympathize with you. Hume acknowledges that this happens sometimes as when I feel embarrassment for a person who is acting the fool in public. But for Hume, this is a hard case to explain, while for Smith it follows readily from how sympathy works in paradigm cases. On seeing someone insulted, I imagine I would feel angry, but not as angry as she seems to be, or on the other hand, more angry. I admire her stoicism, or think she has insufficient self-respect. On seeing someone receive an award, I think I would be rather less pleased with myself, or rather more, than she seems to be. Smithian sympathy opens up a gap between the feelings we have for another and the feelings that she has herself. It is thus something of an achievement if the person sympathizing and the person sympathized with are able to reach a concord of feelings. A second point to note about Smith's account of sympathy is that it consists not simply in feeling what another might feel, but it be in being aware that that is how things feel for him or her. Stephen Darwell lays out the difference between these two things. The first can be illustrated by a famous scenario presented by Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky, and this is the second quote in your handout. Mr. Crane and Mr. Tease were scheduled to leave the airport on different flights at the same time. 
They traveled from town in the same limousine, were caught in a traffic jam, and arrived at the airport 30 minutes after the scheduled departure time of their flights. Mr. Crane is told that his flight left on time. Mr. Tease is told that his was delayed and just left five minutes ago. Most people respond to this scenario by thinking that Mr. Tease will be far more upset than Mr. Crane because they think they would have been far more upset in Mr. T's situation than in Mr. Crane's. They don't think about what it is like to be Mr. T's or Mr. Crane in general, however. They just imagine themselves in their situations. The story could be retold with you in the pace of, uh, place of the character's name and have the same effect. You arrive at the airport, et cetera, et cetera. It would be quite different for us to be told something distinctive about Mr. T's that he's on the verge of being late to a wedding, perhaps, or on the contrary, that he's reluctant to get to his destination and has plenty of reading to do in the airport, and then ask what it might be like to be him in this situation. And that, as Darwall points out, is how Fri uh, Smith frames what he calls sympathy. That brings us to the third passage on the handout, a famous passage from Book 7 of TMS. When I condole with you for the loss of your only son, in order to enter into your grief, I do not consider what I, a person of such a character and profession, should suffer if I had a son and if that son were unfortunately to die, but I consider what I should suffer if I was really you. And I not only change circumstances with you, but I change persons and characters. Darwall offers a nuanced explication of this passage. Consider the difference, he says, between the instructions, A, Imagine what someone would feel if he were to lose his only child, and B, imagine what it would be like for that person to feel that way. Under A, Darwell says, I will think, what a terrible thing, a precious child is lost. Under B, I will think, what a terrible thing for him, he has lost his precious child. The latter thought requires me to consider quote from Darwal, not just the person with the relevant feelings, but someone conscious of his feelings, their phenomenological textures, and relevance for his life, unquote. Let's call the feelings that arise from this latter thought perspectival or Smithian empathy, as opposed to the, pl opposed to the plain empathy we have for Mr. T's and Mr. Crane. Smithian empathy involves the awareness that the other's perspective is different from mine and an attempt to enter his situation from that perspective. A third point about Smith's account. For Smith, the awareness of mutual sympathy is always a source of pleasure. Hume criticized Smith on this score. Writing to Smith in response to the first edition of TMS, he said, the fourth quote on the handout, which is also been discussed a few times this afternoon. I wish you had more particularly and fully proved that all kinds of sympathy are necessarily agreeable. It would appear that there is a disagreeable a sympathy as well as an agreeable. And indeed, as the sympathetic passion is a reflex image of the principle, it must partake of its qualities and be painful where that is so. An ill-humored fellow, a man tired and disgusted with everything, always ennuyé, sickly complaining, embarrassed, such a one throws an evident damp on company, which I suppose would be accounted for by sympathy, and yet is disagreeable. If all sympathy was agreeable, a hospital would be a more entertaining place than a ball. Smith responded to this critique in a footnote added to the second edition, by saying that while it is indeed painful to share the pains of others, we would hardly be sharing them otherwise, the awareness that I share in others' feelings, which Smith identifies with approbation, is always pleasurable. And this is the fifth quotation on the handout. In the sentiment of approbation, there are two things to be taken notice of. First, the sympathetic passion of the spectator, and secondly, the emotion which arises from his observing the perfect coincidence between this sympathetic passion in himself and the original passion in the person principally concerned. This last emotion, in which the sentiment of approbation properly consists, is always agreeable and delightful. The other may be agreeable or disagreeable, according to the nature of the original passion, whose features it must always, in some measure, retain. 
The force of this reply has been missed by some commentators who complain that your bad feelings and my bad feelings on your behalf cannot add up to a good feeling. Smith's point, however, is that the awareness of sympathy is not a matter of adding your feelings to my feelings. It is a new feeling, separate from both your original feeling and my sympathy for that feeling. It is a second-order feeling, we might say, responding to the concord between our two first-order feelings rather than to the objects of those feelings. In addition, for Smith, a sympathetic passion is not a mere reflex image of the principal passion in the other person as it is for Hume. Hume reads his own account of sympathy too much into Smith, as if Smith, too, were a contagion theorist, assuming that my sympathetic feelings straightforwardly mirror your feelings. For Smith, my sympathy arises from thinking myself into your situation, and it is an open question whether I will then feel as you do. If you are ill-humored and constantly complaining, I may not feel any sympathy for you. And if I do feel as you do, then there is a new element to the situation, the harmony between us, about which, if I am aware of it, I will also have feelings. The sentiment of approbation is my reaction to that new element of the situation, not to your feelings alone, nor to my sympathetic feelings for you. There is no reason why this new feeling has to have the character of the original feelings whose concord it marks. And even in cases where the original feelings were painful, says Smith, it does not. It is, rather, always agreeable and delightful. The remaining question is whether this point is true. Smith notes that sympathy, quote, alleviates grief by insinuating into the heart almost the only agreeable sensation which it is at that time capable of receiving, unquote. We take comfort at funerals from the grief of our friends, even if we continue to mourn our own loss. In addition, whatever Hume may have thought, sometimes a hospital is more entertaining than a ball. If I am in somber mood and would rather be around people who are suffering than trying to participate in merriment, or if I disapprove of the ball as a frivolous distraction, say, from a world crisis to which I think people should be attending, imagine a ball held on September 12, 2001. You might not want to be there. You might rather be at the hospital. Then I might rather, well, rather spend my evening at a hospital. In general, Cheerfulness of which we disapprove tends to be depressing, and anger or grief of which we approve tends to instill at least a modicum of pleasure by way of the solidarity we feel with the person experiencing it. And it is that sense of solidarity, I suggest, that Smith most wants to bring out. The awareness of mutual empathy is always pleasurable because in it we experience our membership in common humanity. We find that our feelings are characteristic of the human community and experience that as comforting and encouraging. We don't want to be idiosyncratic in our feelings. Sometimes we are regarded that way and worry about it. A friend or colleague disapproves of my anger, my self-pity, my joy in my accomplishments, even my good cheer, and I fear that I am cut off from other people, that something has gone wrong in my emotional makeup. So it is a relief to find that others do share in my feelings. Finding that others feel as I do signals my acceptance in the general human community, and that is always a pleasure. On this view, we have a felt common humanity rather than a reasoned one, in the sense both that our common humanity consists in certain shared feelings or shared dispositions to have certain feelings, and that we recognize our shared humanity by way of feeling rather than reason. Perhaps this is too sharp a dichotomy insofar as Smithian empathy depends on a reflective process of putting ourselves in another situation. It does require a certain amount of reasoning. But the shared sentimental humanity that arises from this is still sharply different from the shared rational humanity of a Plato or a Kant. Reason alone neither constitutes nor makes us aware of Smith's common humanity. Nor, on the other hand, is Smith's common humanity a purely biological one or a religious posit, something that depends on our having a God-given soul. And one thing that distinguishes Smith's common humanity from these alternatives 
is the degree to which it consists in precisely what makes us different from one another. As we've seen, in Smithian empathy, we are aware of the fact that the person with whom we are empathizing has a distinctive perspective from which she experiences her feelings. If she comes into fellow feeling with me, she is likewise aware of my distinctive perspective. That we have such perspectives, and therefore differ, is precisely one of the things we share and enjoy sharing, which is to say, what unites me sentimentally with the rest of humankind is not just a disposition to certain feelings in certain circumstances, but an ability to be aware of those feelings as from a distinctive perspective. Only because we have distinctive perspectives do we worry about our differences from others. Only because we worry about that do we take pleasure in discovering that we are not so different after all. But that discovery, fully spelled out, amounts to the realization that we are similar while distinct, that we retain our uniqueness even as we have similar reactions. In Smithian empathy, we hold two thoughts together. One, for all our differences, we yet share these reactions. And two, for all that we share, we yet remain different people. Both thoughts are sources of pleasure, and the distinctive pleasure of Smithian empathy is one we take precisely in their combination. They delineate together the kind of human huma common humanity we want to participate in. So Smith's sentimental hu conception of humanity is at the same time a perspectival conception of humanity. To be human for is for Smith not at its core to be rational, or to have a God-given soul, but to develop and sustain a perspective, a point of view, a mesh of opinions and attitudes that respond to the situations we have lived through in the past and shape the way we live through future situations. And because the situations I live through are different from the ones you live through, my perspective will differ from your perspective. What we share, what makes us human and differentiates us from other hum animals, is that we have a perspective. We can also enter one another's perspectives by way of empathy. Indeed, we come to recognize that we have a perspective only by empathetically understanding that others have different perspectives. Our sense of common humanity thus consists in our ability to empathize as much as it does in our having a perspective. There's no way to separate these two things. What it is to be human on this view is to have and maintain a perspective, but we can maintain a perspective only if we can engage in Smithian empathy. We are, at the same time and by the same token, empathetic and perspectival beings. What is a perspective? As I'm using that term, it refers to a more or less coherent network of opinions and attitudes formed in response to events in the world around us. It contrasts with a mere jumble of feelings, with momentary feelings that vanish in the next moment, and with feelings that are disconnected from the world, caused by something in our environment, but doing nothing to represent that cause to us. It also differs from a set of beliefs that we arrive at independently of feeling. The beliefs to which pure reason might bring us will not be a perspective, nor will a collection of arbitrary human feelings representing nothing beyond themselves. A perspective is a subjective take on the world. Many philosophers do not give us an account of mental functioning that yields such an idea. Smith does. In explaining his conception of sympathy, Smith interweaves emotions and opinions. His, a view, his view of how we approve and disapprove of sentiments or passions also depends on viewing them as like opinions, with objects they can fit or not fit. To approve of the passions of another as suitable to their objects, says Smith, is the same thing as to observe that we entirely sympathize with them. He illustrates this point with a variety of examples, sharing another's resentment, keeping time with another's grief, admiring the same poem or picture that another admires, and laughing at the same joke. These examples mix moral with aesthetic reactions, sentiments that respond to an event with sentiments that respond to an action, and sentiments that endure over time, resentment and grief, with momentary feelings of admiration or hilarity. In the next paragraph, Smith explicitly compares sharing emotions with sharing opinions. 
to approve of another man's opinions is to adopt those opinions, he says, which is equally the case with regard to our approbation or disapprobation of the sentiments or passions of others. And in the next chapter, he brings our shared reactions to art, science, and philosophy together with our reactions to one another's grief, happiness, and indignation. So for Smith, our intellectual and emotional experiences are all of a piece, all in some way representative of the world around us and all likely to vary with the different experiences we have of that world. They add up to a general way that we experience the world. This, explain, this helps explain how Smith can speak later in the book of the difference between considering what I would suffer in my own person if I were in your situation and, quote, considering what I should suffer if I was really you, changing persons and characters with you. A person and character seems here very much to be a holistic, subjective take on the world, shaped by experience and social relationships, but not reducible to these external factors. Elsewhere, Smith describes types of characters, the vain man, the proud man, the prudent man in TMS, the uncouth but judicious plowman, the idle and prodigal aristocrat, the bold merchant in the wealth of nations, each of which has a pattern of feeling and acting that differs from the others. These patterns are shaped by external factors while at the same time providing their bearers with a distinctive way of taking in and responding to such factors. In all these respects, Smith talks of people as having not merely character traits, but a character, a comprehensive pattern of feeling and acting that shapes their outlook on the world. That is what I have been calling a perspective. As we've seen, there's a connection between engaging in Smithian empathy and being aware of perspectives, being aware even of our own perspectives. Only if you can enter into the, the perspective of others can you recognize that you have a distinctive perspective of your own. I'd now like to suggest that the connection between empathy and perspectives goes deeper than this, that you cannot even have a perspective unless you can enter empathetically into other people's perspectives. The connection between empathy and perspectivalism is, we may say, a metaphysical and not just an epistemological one. I'll try to make the case for this point by way of a problem in the account of empathy I have presented thus far. I've been taking for granted that there's a clear distinction between plain empathy and Smithian or per perspectival empathy. Most writers on empathy do take this for granted. Darwell does, as we've seen. Peter Goldie distinguishes between empathy and in his shoes imagining. The former imag involves imagining myself as another in his or her situation, while the latter requires me to figure out how I would feel in the other situation. These distinctions seem intuitively plausible, but they presuppose that we can have stable and sharply delineated perspectives independently of empathy. I'd now like to question that presupposition. Is there really such a thing as my perspective and your perspective independently of empathy? Consider what it means for me to enter another's situation as me. Suppose I'm trying to feel my way into the shoes of a black person in America who has been subjected to a racial threat, or a poor person who has lost or been cheated out of $10. Can I really enter so much as their situations without thinking about what it is like to be them in that situation? My being subjected to a racial threat or insult is unlikely to have the practical consequences or emotional impact that such a thing would have on a black person. And my being deprived of $10 will have a much smaller effect on my life than a similar loss would have on the life of a poor person. So even to enter the other's situation properly, I must become her to a significant degree. I can't so much as try on her shoes if I remain wholly me in imagination. There is, moreover, no clear limit to how much I must take on board to get her situation right. The effect of a flight delay on an impatient person's life is different from the effect of a delay on a calm person's life. The effect of a setback on the life of a person with a fragile ego is different from the effect of a setback on a person with great self-confidence. What counts as a person's situation cannot be neatly separated off from how she feels about those situations. 
nor can her feelings be separated off from her prior history, including her prior psychological history. The situations we are in include our dispositions to react emotionally to those situations and the histories that have bred such dis dispositions in us. Accordingly, we can't really enter other people's shoes without also empathizing with them to some degree. Goldie's distinction between empathy and in his shoes imagining and the parallel one in Darwal cannot be clearly made out. By the same token, we can't really imagine what it might be like to be another without also imagining what it might be like to be in his shoes. How can I figure out what it is like to be you without imagining what it would be like for me to occupy your historical and social position or live through your experiences? Who are you apart from all these things? Your characteristics, a cheerful or cynical attitude towards life, athletic skill or the lack of it, charm or irritability are after all largely the product of your position and experiences. On the other hand, if I try to take on all of your experiences and characteristics, leaving nothing of myself behind, I will no longer be empathizing at all, merely attempting to merge with you. Actually merging with you is impossible, I believe, and even holding up such a thing as an ideal obscures the fact that it is I who must do the imagining and I must draw on my own experiences and feelings in order to feel my way into you. I could, of course, simply mimic what you say or do, but this would no longer be a way of feeling myself into you. In none of these ways can I imagine myself in your perspective or character. I instead lose sight of myself altogether and consequently lose the ability to have feelings of my own for you. If I try to merge with you, I will certainly fail to achieve what Smith thinks we seek to achieve by way of imaginative projection. I will fail to reach a position from which I can access your feelings as appropriate or inappropriate to their situation. To assess feelings as appropriate to a situation, one needs a certain distance from the perspective of the person who has those feelings. One needs to be able to abstract from those factors in the other's emotional state that lead him or her to react too strongly or not strongly enough or to react, as in some of Smith's own examples, like a lunatic, a child, or an impudent and rude fool. It is, moreover, intrinsic to empathy, independent of its relationship to moral judgment, that we manage this distance from the other. For the lunatic and child and fool, were they fully aware of what they were doing, would probably also react differently than they do. They may indeed be trying to do so even as we watch them. Certainly people with greater control over themselves often try to do that. We misjudge others if we take them to be stuck in their perspectives, if we don't recognize the degree to which they themselves are trying to peer beyond the limits of self-awareness that their habits or history have placed upon them. We all constantly try to see ourselves as others see us, and change ourselves in response to that view. Something frustrating happens to me and I gather from my friends' responses whether I am overreacting to it or not reacting strongly enough. I am unexpectedly successful in something and take a quick surreptitious glance around the room before determining whether I should be bursting out in rapture or feeling something more modest and expressing it in more measured tones. All my responses are shaped by an inward glance at how I think an impartial spectator might react. These efforts at self-understanding and self-transformation are part of what it is to have as perspective. One who strives to empathize with me will fail if she assumes that every detail of who I am is fixed. Empathy requires of us that we not freeze the perspective of the people with whom we are empathizing, not lock it into one determinate form. A spectator who thinks that I will necessarily react with fear or jealousy to a particular situation because I have tended to react that way in the past underestimates the degree to which I try to change my responses to things, underestimates what Smith would call my self-command. I am in central part a being who tries to control and change his reactions. Part of my very perspective is an effort to alter elements of that perspective. So if you are trying to be me, you will miss something if you fix my dispositions and attitudes and assume that they cannot become like yours or like those of an impartial spectator. 
putting too much of the other's affective background into her situation is a way of misconstruing her, of not taking her self-command seriously enough. By the same token, I should not assume when attempting to understand myself that my reactions or perspective are fixed. I am a wilting wallflower, say, and you are forthright and fearless. I watch you take a his heroic stance on an issue and I think I would never have the guts to do that. But do I really know that about myself? My very admiration for you bespeaks some motivation to become like you. And if I can enter empathetically into the circumstances and practices that have given you courage, I surely have some understanding of what I need to do to achieve it myself. In a future situation, I might, I might well think, what would you do and do that? I misconstrue myself, my self-command, if I think I am incapable of this. I need instead always to assume that the other could be me and that I could be her. That is what it means for human beings to be capable of fellow feeling and to locate their shared humanity in that capacity. But then there will be no sharp line between being me in your shoes and being you in your shoes. Our best sense of who we are is a constantly moving target, a perspective whose contours we come to understand and control only insofar as we engage in a constant process of empathizing with other perspectives. We do not have a perspective independent of empathy, and our attempts at empathy change our perspectives. Ourselves are determinate to the extent that they are only by way of empathetic relationships with other selves, which move constantly between what we have in common and what differentiates us. So dis to distinguish imagining myself in your shoes sharply from imagining myself as you obscures the degree to which our situations depend on who we are, who we are depends on our situations, and our perspectives include an effort to go beyond their own limitations. It, it obscures, in short, the degree to which I am always trying to see myself as you in our empathetic interactions, and you are trying always to see yourself as me. We do not merge with one another, but who we each are depends inextricably on how we see others. This brings us to Smith's conception of the self, which I think he sees as arising from the process of empathy. I have no self independent of having a perspective for Smith, and I have no perspective independent of my empathetic interactions with others. To elaborate. For Smith, we are driven to reflect on ourselves, which for him means entering our own perspectives as if from the perspective of another, only after realizing that others are doing the same to us. And this brings us to the sixth quotation on the handout. Our first moral criticisms are exercised upon the characters and conduct of other people, but we soon learn that other people are equally frank with regard to our own. We become anxious to know how far we deserve their censure or applause, and whether to them we must appear those agreeable or disagreeable creatures which they represent us. We begin upon this account to examine our own passions and conduct and to consider how these must appear to them by considering how they would appear to us if in their situation. We suppose ourselves as spectators of our own behavior and endeavor to imagine what effect it would in this light produce upon us. So our notion of ourselves arises in the first instance from our response to how others see us. Indeed, Smith says explicitly that we can arrive at this notion only in and from society. And this is passage seven on the handout. Were it possible that a human creature could grow up to manhood in some solitary place without any communication with his own species, he could no more think of his own character of the beauty or deformity of his own mind than of the beauty or deformity of his own face. All these are objects which he cannot easily see, which naturally he does not look at, and with regard to which he is provided with no mirror, which can present them to his view. Bring him into society, and he is immediately provided with the mirror which he wanted before. A person who was a stranger to society, Smith says, would attend only to quote, the objects of his passions, the external bodies which pleased or hurt him, 
It would never occur to him to notice his passions themselves, the joys or sorrows which those objects excited. Without the mirror of society, we would not become aware that we so much as had a self. That puts the point too weakly, however. Without the mirror provided by society, we would not just be unaware that we had a self. We would, in fact, not have a self. The metaphor of the mirror is misleading. I have a body before I see it in the mirror. The mirror gives me a way of becoming aware of my body, but my body exists whether I'm aware of it or not. On the Cartesian and Lockean views of the self from which early modern philosophers begin, however, myself does not exist if I am not aware of it. A self on these views is by definition something that reflects upon itself, that is self-aware. So Smith's self cannot so much as exist until it is awakened to such reflection by society. Society brings the self into existence and at the same time provides the standards guiding its characteristic acts of self-reflection, which for Smith are first and foremost acts of moral self-reflection. Smith responds to Hume's deconstruction of the self in book one of the treatise, much as Kant does, by positing a continuous self for moral purposes. But Smith, unlike Kant, sees the social construction of the self as necessary to that moral posit. Hume had concluded his chapter on personal identity by suggesting himself that the identity we attribute to the self, like the identity we attribute to a church that is rebuilt in a new style, may serve social purposes. But for Hume, this was just evidence that the self is a fiction. For Smith, there is nothing fictional about the self. It is a posit we cannot do without, cannot think away or see beyond and as real as anything else whose existence we need to posit. Nor is there anything worrying about the fact that that posit results from a process of social construction. That's just how posits in science and morality arise. But on this conception of the self, constructed for moral purposes out of our acts of empathy with others and with ourselves as if we were another, I will have no self prior to my acts of empathy. I come to determine who you are by distinguishi distinguishing your perspective from mine, and I come to determine who I am by distinguishing my perspective from yours. And what I take to belong properly to you and what I take to belong properly to me may change as I proceed with this imaginative and interpretive process. It follows that there will be no natural pre-empathetic self to which I might turn in order to ground a distinction between imagining being myself in your situation and imagining being you in it. That distinction will arise rather from the process of empathy. More precisely, I will come to determine both who you are and who I am by contrasting our perspectives with that of the impartial spectator. The impartial spectator is, of course, the centerpiece of Smith's moral system. It's a device that, Smith says, we build within ourselves in response to the fact that people often judge us out of misinformation or bias. We want to know how we would look instead to someone who knew all the facts relevant to what we've done and had no reason to favor either us or anyone else in our situation. What the impartial spectator approves and disapproves of will, Smith says, set the standard for what we ourselves should approve or disapprove of. But my focus today is not on Smith's moral theory. I want to stress instead the role that the impartial spectator plays in our psychology, in our construal of who other people are and who we are ourselves. The impartial spectator tells me how a human being in general, anyone, would think or feel in this particular situation. So to the extent that you don't seem to think or feel that way, I take you to have a distinctive perspective on the world and I come to see myself similarly as having a distinctive perspective by way of my differences from the impartial spectator. At the same time, the impartial spectator is also constructed out of the various actual spectator perspectives I encounter as corrected for bias and misinformation. There is on this view no stable essentialist conception of the human self to be found. We are instead constantly making sense of ourselves and others by way of a triangulation among self-perspectives, 
other perspectives and a notional impartial spectator perspective. This is, I think, an immensely plausible view. As I try to figure out what is peculiar to my take on the world, I constantly note ways in which I react to, say, rudeness or family squabbles differently from you. At the same time, I conduct a comparison in my mind's eye of both of our reactions with the reactions that anyone, a vague anyone, which reflects everyone I know, might have to such behavior. I also note your differences from me and from anyone when I try to figure out your take on the world. You are an observant Jewish academic like me, let's say, but you're always calm and accepting when fellow academics schedule events on Jewish holidays while I get upset. I think to myself, why this difference between us? Is she more generous-minded or stoic than I am, recognizing wisely that the Christian world we live in can't be expected to accommodate itself to our needs? Or is she conformist or cowardly, unwilling to speak up for her rights? By the same token, I wonder whether my indignation is a mark of self-respect and a willingness to stand up for my people, or just of spleen and self-indulgence. And to settle these questions, I think, how might an impartial spectator react? What would be the response to these sorts of situations of an unbiased and well-informed anyone? The impartial spectator thus guides the process of construction by which I interpret who you are and who I am, provides norms, standards for that process, a benchmark of how people in general feel or act, against which I can recognize and assess my and your peculiarities. At the same time, this anyone is itself constantly under construction, a product of how I interpret the many yous I encounter and eyes I imagine myself to be. This is a complicated and fluid conception of selfhood, but it is also phenomenologically accurate and very useful for moral purposes. It explains nicely how and why our notions of ourselves are tied up with our notions of who we think we should be, and how and why we tend to try to change ourselves in the course of trying to understand ourselves. Selfhood on this picture is not a fiction, as Hume would have it. It is instead a necessary and ineliminable component of our moral and psychological reflections. But it is indeterminate, ever-changing, and a reflection of and response to our social environments. I'd like to close with a broader historical point. If I'm right about Smith's linking of empathy to perspective, a construal of our humanity in terms of them, he's one of the first philosophers to explore a theme that has been central to literature, popular culture, and politics ever since his time. The 18th century is notable for its emphasis on both empathy and perspectivalism. The centrality of empathy to 18th century moral thought is well known. Lynn Hunt and Thomas Lecoeur have demonstrated how much it shaped not just moral philosophy, but everyday moral thought and the ideas that went into movements for the abolition of slavery or the proclamation of human rights. Lecoeur says that the humanitarian narrative his term of the 18th century, he gives the realistic novel, the autopsy, and the clinical report as examples, inspired political change by speaking, quote, in an extraordinarily detailed fashion about the pains and deaths of ordinary people while making apparent the causal chains that might connect the actions of its readers with the suffering of its subjects, unquote. Hunt asks whether it can be merely, quote, coincidental that the three greatest novels of psychological identification of the 18th century, Richardson's Pamela and Cl Clarissa and Rousseau's Julie, were all published in the period that immediately preceded the appearance of the concept of the rights of man, unquote. She also provides a detailed argument for the ways in which the art and music of the 18th century aimed at the arousal of empathy in its viewers and listeners. And the idea that empathy, rather than reason or our having been created in the image of God, is the main source of our ability to see others as hum fellow human beings is new in this period. Less well attended to, but implicit in what Lecoeur and Hunt are teaching us, is the fact that the 18th century also saw the invention or discovery of the idea of a perspective. Hunt describes how people marveled at the ability of Richardson to immerse his readers in the worlds he created, to 
create the impression that you are present in those worlds, and how Rousseau embraced the fact that novels seduce us into living vicariously in, quote, an estate that is not our own, unquote. But this is a call to inhabit other people's perspectives. Novels give us entry into subjective worlds or estates other than our own. Our objective world as seen through the eyes of people different from us. We enter the head of Amal Flanders or Pamely or Julie, as we would later enter the head of Dickens' Pip or Tol Tolstoy's Pierre Betzuhoff or the various unhappy Buddenbrook siblings. This entering the head of another, learning to appreciate their psychological perspective in great detail, is the stock and trade of novelists and something rarely to be found in ancient or medieval literature. Famously, the novel is an 18th century invention which enables a new kind of sentimental identification among people. But that identification is inextricable from a new appreciation of the subjective differences among us and the degree to which our subjective features come together in a distinctive whole, a perspective. This amounts indeed to a new I. Consider in particular first personal novels. We get glimpses of the inner workings of Iago and Hamlet by way of their monologues, but we are not invited to enter their subject subjective worlds holistically or to consider how their passions and attitudes add up to a subjective whole. In earlier literature, the first person was generally an ex exemplary I standing in for any of us. The first person in the Psalms or in Paul's letters or Augustine's Confessions is meant to represent the religious yearnings or journey of any human being. We are meant to see ourselves in it. By contrast, the first person in Dickens' Great Expectations or Dostoevsky's Underground Man is a distinctive human being who is emphatically not the same as the reader, but whose subjective world we are meant nevertheless to enter. I suggest it is no more coincidental than an emphasis on empathy came together with an emphasis on distinctive perspectives than that it was followed by the proclamation of human rights. Empathy and perspectivalism belong together. It becomes important for me to empathize with you only if you have a distinctive perspective that I cannot learn about simply by looking to common human reason or a general theory of human nature. I understand that you have such a perspective, however, and even that I had such a perspective only by way of empathy. This is Smith's position as I understand it. But Smith was just expressing, more clearly than his peers and predecessors, a view that was coming to the fore throughout the literature, politics, and moral practice of his time. In this, Smith helped develop a new perspectival conception of humanity. There are some very attractive features of this conception. In the first place, I suspect that most of us simply feel that we are most ourselves in having a distinctive perspective on the world. To say that my proper self consists in occupying this perspective and being aware of it as such rings much more true than saying, as Kant does, that pure reason is my proper self. Saying that my proper self consists in my having a God-given soul, on the other hand, tells me little. Even if I am a devout theist, I am unlikely to be sure what this means. In the second place, the notion of a perspective includes the workings of my reason as well as my feelings. It's shaped by how I reason about the situations I'm in and the poems or systems of philosophy I admire, not just by my unadorned feelings. So it can take on board much that is plausible in Kantian as well as Humean views of human nature. It can give the same weight to reasoning over coercion that Kantians do. It is just as egalitarian as a Kantian view. And it can demand the same sort of respect for others that Kantians do. Indeed, by requiring us to respect the differences between ourselves and others, and not just our commonalities, it may do a better job of capturing what we mean by respect than Kantians do. Relatedly, while Smithian empathy does not entail that we care for people, it's a condition for respectful, sensitive, and nuanced caring. We're likely to care badly where we don't care out of Smithian empathy. We're likely to care in a way that does not reflect an awareness of the difference between our perspective and the perspectives of those we care for. Which is to say, if I'm right about the links among empathy, 
perspectivalism and humanity, that we are likely to care in a way that does not adequately reflect an awareness of the other's humanity. When we make sure that Smithian perspectival empathy directs our caring, we care as one unique human being for another. We respect our differences from others as well as our commonalities. In Kant's terms, we respect the humanity in others and display the humanity in ourselves. Or in the terms of the modern Kantian John Rawls, we show how seriously we take the distinction among persons. Neither Kant nor his follover, followers have ever made very good sense of that distinction, however. Smith does. His perspectival conception of humanity and the empathy that underlies it capture perfectly, I think, what we take to be most valuable about ourselves, what defines and explains why we are, each and all, of absolute and intrinsic value. Thank you. <laughs>